Everything is turned upside down. Um, we write papers, we go to international and national regional meetings, we present our data, it's all well thought out, it gets published by peer reviewed. You know, maybe a newspaper will pick up an article if it's got some policy change associated with it. This flipped around completely the other way. Welcome back to another episode of the Anonymous Therapy Podcast. I'm your host, Joe Chura. And on today's show, we have Dr. Robert Murphy. In fact, you just heard from him. Dr. Murphy is the executive director for the Institute for Global Health, as well as the head of infectious disease at Northwestern School of Medicine. He has been with Northwestern for over 40 years. And when he began his tenure at Northwestern, he saw and treated the first reported AIDS patient in Chicago. Dr. Murphy's main focus of his life's work has been on HIV infection, viral hepatitis, antiviral drug development, and global health research. In this episode, I asked Dr. Robert Murphy about his involvement in insights regarding the COVID pandemic. His, he has been working with infectious diseases for, again, over four decades. And he shares parallel stories from his experiences being a child during the polio outbreak. Additionally, Dr. Murphy provides context into history repeating itself a bit from the time period of the Spanish flu. We dig into the timeline of COVID, what went right, what went wrong, what and why are there so many vaccines? He stumps me on a trivia question, and then we dive into the effectiveness of the vaccines, and he even gives a prediction of what can happen over the next 12 to 24 months. I love your feedback as always. Let's jump right into the conversation from now with the one and only Dr. Robert Murphy. Dr. Robert Murphy, it's great to have you here on the podcast today. Hey, thanks for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. Uh, first off, I'd love to to know a little bit about you more. I know we were talking off air just a few minutes ago about your background, but uh, how long have you been in infectious disease? Well, I began my training in infectious diseases in 1981, so 40 years ago. Uh, the first week I was, a, we call it a fellow uh, in infectious diseases. We had our first uh, AIDS case here in Chicago, and I, I took care of the first case. And uh, at that time, Infectious diseases was really a consult in hospital consultant type job uh, and profession, and starting with HIV and AIDS, that ended up being really a mixture of inpatient and outpatients. And I started the first one of the first AIDS clinics here in Chicago. Did you ever think back then that something like this was uh, like COVID, the period that we're going through, um, would have ever happened? Oh, yes. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> this, is what, this is what I trained for, uh, you know, because I, I started with HIV AIDS, uh, but I also worked, uh, I remember toxic shock syndrome, uh, herpes used to really be important, still is important, uh, Ebola virus. Uh, I worked mostly internationally when I could travel. Now I can't travel, uh, but I, I uh, was the administrative director of a, a lab doing the diagnostics for Ebola in West Africa and Mali. And uh, so I've seen a few epidemics. And when COVID came around, what surprised me was the extent of COVID. I mean, I, it caught everybody off guard. People really didn't think it was going to be a, a, a pandemic that is, you know, still raging in the world. That, 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 had, that caught everybody by surprise including me. When is the first time you realized how serious it was? Um, it's very interesting. <laughs> uh, it was before most people really got it. When I saw the numbers, how they were increasing, that's called exponential growth. So, you know, at yeah. the beginning, it's one, two, four. You know, who cares about that? But then you're 2,000, 4,000, 8,000. And I immediately hopped in my car and went to Costco and loaded up with $2,000 worth of non-perishable items. Get out of here. When, when was that? That was, what was the March. time frame? In March? Yeah, March 2020. Wow. Um, because I thought that really uh, things would shut down, which they did. Uh, fortunately, it was not as bad as it could have been. Um, and, you know, uh, what I did, I didn't really have to do. Um, 
but uh, you know we were we managed to keep the stores open uh, and essential services going, which in some ways kept the pandemic uh, going worse here in the U.S. You know, you look at China. You know, they had to order their food online for six months, and they delivered to their building once a week. You know, there wow. was no interaction, but that's how they they stopped it there. But, you know, that was never going to happen in America. (laughs) But, uh, you know, so we have it down to a dull roar. So that's good. And when you had your first patient, was it at that point, did you have a lot of information or how how did you communicate with, uh, with fellow doctors, the CDC and so forth to really understand like how you should be even treating patients? You know, that's a really good question because everything is turned upside down. Um, We write papers. We go to international and national regional meetings. We present our data. It's all well thought out. It gets published by peer reviewed. You know, maybe a newspaper will pick up an article if it's got some policy change associated with it. This flipped around completely the other way. I get almost all my new news from The New York Times and... uh, the uh, Washington Post and the Atlantic. And, uh, you know, the, I get it from the mainstream media, if you consider them mainstream. CNN, you know, I mean, they're my big resource now because they get they get the items as they come out. Uh, it's really incredible how fast we we communicate now. I mean, it, it, it's changed everything. Wow, that is, that is truly incredible. I wouldn't even have... I would think there's some back-channel communication going on between doctors and the CDC exchanging that. But I guess as soon as that's published, as soon as there's new information, they just have a faster way to, to well, spread that, it, these news the outlets. Trouble, the trouble with uh, the prior administration was their control of the information with a few exceptions was uh, not really communicating uh, quickly enough and good enough. And so the, the press... And the, the media, like yourself, you guys, you men and women, you know, you took it upon yourself to dig down, go right to the scientists in charge and talk to them. And we ended up getting the information uh, from you and from the British uh, and then the few institutions uh, in the United States that are really uh, designed to track these uh, these type of problems, like the University of Washington, like Johns Hopkins. Uh, those are really the two kind of key ones. We couldn't really, the government, you know, governments are governments. <laughs> you know, they take a little while to get their stuff together. Um, and, you know, Hopkins and the University of Washington really were kind of driving the show along with the University College of London uh, and several other, and the WHO, but they're pretty governmental oriented too. But uh, between, uh, Lond- uh, excuse me, Imperial College Hopkins and Washington, that was where we're getting most of our information, especially early on. Got it. Yeah, no, that that makes sense. What, uh, what did we get wrong initially? Like, what was the, the thing that you look back at the start of this and say that, or maybe there's more than one thing that we got just completely wrong? Well, we... We, 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 I, we're, I'm sure we're going to talk about it, but we, there were a couple really good things that happened. But the bad things that happened was the, the disconnect between public health in the United States, which has always been and structurally continues to be weak, and the public. The public has lost confidence in the public health officials. Uh, they've lost confidence in science. People don't believe in science. They don't believe you know, maybe they believe the doctor that's taking care of them when they're sick, but they've they've lost they've lost that uh, uh, respect uh, for some of the leaders in the field, um, and maybe some of those leaders in the field don't deserve, don't deserve the respect. <laughs> but anyway, that disconnect was um, devastating for the country, really, because you created all this doubt and second guessing. I mean, I grew up in, as a kid in the polio epidemic. I mean, we were tetrifi- petrified about getting polio. And when they came out with the vaccine for polio, I remember we lined up at the fire station. We were told 
you know, they did it by churches, <laughs> like churches, synagogue, whatever. <laughs> yeah. And they said, okay, your church is going on Tuesday to the firehouse and you're getting your polio shots. And we just like marched over there. <laughs> yeah, there wasn't <laughs> any second we just, guessing. We just got in line and we were happy to get it. You know, we were so happy. And like, it was like 99% compliance. There was nobody that doubted that the vaccine was going to save you. You had every day in the supermarket, you had a picture of a kid in an iron lung and you put your extra dime. Remember the March of Dimes? For your, oh, yeah. For your young. Of course. I mean, <laughs> the dimes were for the polio uh, kids. And you would, if you had an extra dime, you stuck it on this thing. March of Dimes. Anyway, that changed. You know, that was the 50s, you know. And uh, now people just don't buy it. They doubt it. There's... It's just uh, a little bit crazy. And then some of the um, uh, people that get, got a lot of attention were really inco- incompetent. I mean, really grossly incompetent. And uh, that was really kind of sad. That's where we goofed up the most, uh, unfortunately. But there were many good things that happened at the beginning. With the polio vaccine, was that, what was the time frame in which that was created? Is some of the, the doubt now the the expedited time frame that there is lack of long-term testing and various things like that. I can't imagine there was that long of testing before with the polio. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, the, it, it was considered a miracle. Uh, and uh, uh, if, you, if you know the polio history, in one of the first batches that was developed, there was a flaw in the, mm. in the uh, vaccine manufacturing. And kids got sick, and some of them died from polio because of this manufacturing problem. And still, even with that happening, they fixed the problem, they identified what it was, and then they went right back out and continued with the vaccination. Everyone said, well, that was too bad, but we're going forward. I mean, it didn't slow it down at all. I mean, that's the difference. Can you imagine that happening today? Yeah, no. (laughs) No. That's not going to happen today. (laughs) Was. Was it what? So it was a pretty similar time frame, though, as far as how fast it was created and and. Uh, um, no, 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 no. The, there's nothing has been created as fast as the vaccines for COVID. No, I mean, no, I mean, considering this virus was identified December 31st publicly, they had the Chinese had it genetically sequenced by the third week of January. 2020, immediately investigators around the world started working on uh, that genetic code in building uh, these vaccines. By March, they were in humans, you know, not too many, but, you know, they got the dose down, they went to phase two, they got into phase three by the summer in the height of the epidemic. And on, from a a clinical study type perspective, that's good. If you're having an epidemic, that's the best way to test a vaccine. And the, 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 the 30,000 people were enrolled, you know, within weeks, and they, got, they were getting sick so fast that they had endpoints by October. And the first one was approved, Pfizer was approved in December, beginning of December and Moderna at the end. That's yeah. like, it's incredible. Within 12 months, if you had asked me or any other public health expert, are we going to have a vaccine in 2020? 99 out of 100 would have said no, no way. Maybe mid 2021, maybe 2022. I mean, really, I mean, I'm like aghast that it's worked, but it's the technology. It's so advanced. They tested it in all the animals and everything really quickly. And they got the patient, 30,000 patients enrolled in a matter of a month or two, all that together. But it also, the other good thing that happened in this whole craziness is uh, an organization in the government called BARDA. Have you ever heard of them? Yes, I have. Yeah. So BARDA, one of the brilliant things they did was shovel the money. $10 billion went out the door approximately, into the companies that are making these vaccines. You know, these companies making vaccines, it's expensive. You know, you got to enroll 30,000 patients. You know how much it costs to do a 30,000 patient study? 
they're still following those patients. I mean, it costs hundreds of millions of dollars. They just like got a big scooper and they just threw the money. Yeah. Like Pfizer said, oh, we didn't take any money from the government. Oh, by the way, the U.S. government just paid $1.95 billion pre-purchasing a, a vaccine they didn't even have. Yeah. Do you want to unpack what, what BARDA is for the audience, though? Um, actually, the acronym, I'm not really quite sure what it is, but it's a U.S. government agency that uh, is uh, uh, purchases uh, products and stuff and manages uh, big uh, money deals within the whole government manufacturing and uh, regulation process. Um, and um, they uh, just teamed up with the vaccine companies and just shoveled it out there. Like nobody got less than a half a billion. And for especially a small company, that's great. And then the, the biotech companies that developed the uh, vaccines then partnered with the bigger companies. So like BioNTech, this little German company, I mean, it's like, it's a very, very small company. They partnered with Pfizer. So it's BioNTech, Pfizer with all this bar to money. And then Moderna was actually co-developed at the NIH itself, National Institutes for Health at the Vaccine Research Center. And they partnered with Moderna, a relatively small biotech company in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Then the guys at Harvard, at, uh, I think it's a uh, uh, B.I. Deaconess part of Harvard, um, Dan Baruch's virology group developed the, uh, the AD26 uh, virus, uh, excuse me, AD26 vaccine, which Johnson & Johnson partnered with, with them and then took that out. Novavax is the next one that's coming out. Uh, they are a small company in Maryland. Uh, they got a lot of barter of money, and they're going to be out on the market pretty soon. AstraZeneca was developed by the University of Oxford and then in partnership with AstraZeneca. So that, that's how that worked. Even they got barter of money. The, the different companies, because obviously the popular ones, Moderna, Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, obviously Johnson & Johnson had some negative publicity, which probably lowered the public's confidence. What is the fundamental difference between these? And do they, uh, is one much better than the other? Yeah, no, there's, there's actually a very big difference. They both end up doing the same thing. But the, what they call the message RNA, mRNA, little m, and then capital R, capital N, capital A, mRNA viruses, that, that mechanism is very sophisticated. It's not new. It's about 10 years old or so. They started using that, trying to develop other vaccines, and never, nothing ever came forward with it until this. But that technology is so sophisticated. Um, on, a, on a scale of things, it's actually easy to make once you actually figure out how to do it and everything. <laughs> it sends a little message in there, tells the cell to click on uh, you know, parts of the cell and to make a piece of the spike protein which is the little red thing that comes out of the, everyone's seen the picture of the ball with the little red spikes. They call it the spike protein. It makes that, tells your cell to make that spike protein. So it makes the spike protein, it goes out there. The body, the immune system, your little army of little cells and everything, fighting everything off, says, oh, this is an alien thing, and it attacks <laughs> it. And, and that, it's like having like the right key to the right door. You know, it's just like, uh, yeah. it's just incredibly sophisticated. At the beginning, not only did we think that we weren't going to be able to do a vaccine for one or two years, but we thought, well, maybe the efficacy is going to be maybe 50 percent. Also wrong. <laughs> We're wrong, but wrong on the good way of being wrong. It's like 90 percent, 90, 95 percent effective. That's like, wow, this is like incredible. Yeah, um, is Johnson incredible. and Johnson uses a, a more traditional approach using a, quote, harmless adenovirus, which can cause colds. Uh, and a lot of the adenoviruses don't do anything. They're everywhere. Uh, and they took one of these harmless ones and they put the code in there and, and that uh, delivers it. Now, uh, same thing with AstraZeneca. They use a chimpanzee adenovirus for theirs. Um, so uh, it's just a different, that's a slightly older technology. There are some other vaccines out there with these uh, viral vectors. But uh, that's the difference. And their efficacy rate, 
Uh, it's a different, it's a little bit hard to compare them head to head because they occurred at different parts of the epidemic and there were different variants floating around. So the, the Johnson & Johnson one is about 72% effective, uh, but the other ones are 90%. And there is a little bit difference in the populations, but the mRNA vaccines are a home run. Why, why are, were they all created using different mechanisms versus yeah. what, once they yeah. found one that works, why not? Because we didn't know, what, or they don't know, nobody knew which one was going to work. Got it. BARDA invested in these eight or ten companies thinking that maybe one or two would be successful. So in the first three they're all, all three are successful. AstraZeneca, you know, they're having their problems, but it's still be, it's approved in Europe and it's being used. Uh, and Novavax is also a bar to think. So they haven't had any real strikeouts so far. Uh, four vaccines have stopped um, development. Uh, two of them were by Merck. And I'm not sure if they got bar to money or not, but uh, compared to the over 100 vaccines that are being studied, only four have dropped out completely. And so it's best if you don't, you're in a pandemic, people are dying. Um, you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket and say, oh, six months later, well, we got to go back and get that other one. The best thing is to do exactly what BARDA did. Throw the money around, give it to all the different technologies and see which one works. That's actually sort of the American kind of style. Uh, and this is why the Europeans and Canadians are always so far behind us, because they're always too careful. They're, you know, let's get look at the good one first, and then we'll go to the next one or whatever. In the U.S., no. Just let's do them all and see who wins, basically, who does the best. And then that'll be the way to go. And, and they were surprised how fast it happened. They were surprised how good it works. And they were surprised how many worked. So, so now there's some sort of scale real or imaginary of quality of these vaccinations. If yeah. someone got a vaccination on, let's call it the lower quality scale or the less yeah. effective scale, what, what do you tell that person? Like, is there, is there going to be a booster that is going to make yeah. up that difference or how does that work? Yeah, that, no, that's a great question. I don't think you're locked into whatever you took the first time. Uh, you've got some immunity. Uh, it may go down. It may get lower, uh, or the virus may change and it may not work anymore. So your booster should really be geared towards these variants that are out there, which they now call alpha, beta, gamma, delta. So delta is the Indian one uh, that really the vaccines are barely working on. So they're going to have to tweak those vaccines. The nice thing about the mRNA vaccine is that that tweaking is at like basically the molecular level. And right. it's not that difficult to do. And they're doing it. Right. So it's like the, the message bus has already been created. Now right. it's just a mad, matter of, of tweaking it. To right. And the other, back, the, the really, to, to be fair, the adenovirus vector vaccines and the, the uh, um, uh, viral uh, protein vaccines, are they're, they're changing their vaccine too, to the, to the newer viruses. I mean, they're working on them. Looking back now, would you have done anything different, uh, patients under your care, or anything that you've seen that now just seems yeah. obvious? Yeah, there's um, yeah, there's a couple things that could have been done better. One is we uh, we really blew it. We we are a standout country in terms of how bad we did with the virus. We have six hundred thousand people have died. Uh, Thirty. Over 33 million people have gotten sick, and those estimates are probably off by a factor of at least two. All right. This has been a catastrophe. 14% of the people that even have mild disease have symptoms two and six months later, these long hauler people. It's, it's a catastrophe. Look at, um, I, I like to compare us with Australia uh, and the US, you know, English speaking countries. One is much bigger than the other one. Australia is only 25 million people. But Australia, like a bad day in Australia with COVID is like 20 cases. <laughs> Here we're having, we're having, they're opening up the ballparks and everything because we only had, you know, 
11,000 cases yesterday in the United yeah. States, whatever it was. You know, it's just uh, Australia and New Zealand in particular, you know, they're also islands, uh, have been able to control this whole thing, and China, actually, with just social mitigation, masks and social distancing and limiting crowd size. Um, and they should be applauded for that until the vaccines come along. Uh, it's very tough on the population. Uh, they don't like it, but, you know, on the other hand, they don't have hardly any disease. Their death rates are super low. Hardly anybody's gotten sick. Uh, we could have done a lot better, but we have a structurally weak public health system. And not only is it weak, the first batch of public health people working on this were also really not good leaders. I'll just be blunt. Uh, there was, uh, you know, basically crazy people in there. You know, <laughs> I'm not going to mention the names. But anyway, there, were, there was craziness. And that caused this division. And if you look at people who are not going to take the vaccine um, right now, it's, you know, we always have our uh, groups that are skeptical of the government. African-Americans, very skeptical. You know, they have a history of being mistreated, used as guinea pigs. You know, it, it, it's justified that they're skeptical. And plus, many live in neighborhoods where they don't have medical, many medical facilities. And there's all those hundred reasons for everything. There's them. Then you have the inner city Hispanic populations. And, you know, most of them don't speak English, you know, as a first language, or many of them. And the messaging to them has been, you know, like, you got to just listen to these, you know, white Anglos talking and just get it. You know, this is like, it doesn't work, you know. So yeah. they don't know what we're talking about uh, for a lot. So there's, so those two groups are a little bit harder to to get, you know, to, to work with, but they can be worked with. You can get their role models and their leaders and everything to work with them. And, and that's actually going pretty well. That, that I'm not worried about them. But the group that is the most difficult one to reach with about COVID, about the truth about the virus, about the truth about the vaccine, about acceptance of the vaccine, taking the vaccine, are white Republican men. Now, I've never heard of a disease where a political party had anything to do with somebody's risk. Like, what? <laughs> I, I mean, it just doesn't make any difference. Like, why would a group of people, whatever they are, just not believe in the science? They don't believe they don't actually believe that COVID is a big problem. I mean, some of the politicians today, they've even had COVID now. 90, this is a problem when 98% of the people survive. I mean, it's great that 98% people, 98% of the people survive. But it's really bad for those 2% that, that don't survive. They're dead. Uh, and if you look at, you know, we, I just told you, 600,000 at least deaths. I say, oh, well, we have 333 million people in the country. All right. We have 2.8 million deaths per year in the United States. And this thing has been chugging along for a little bit over a year, and we add another 600,000 deaths on top of that. That's increasing the number of people who die in a one-year period of time, you know, by, by like 25% or something. I mean, I have to do the math again. You know, it's yeah. not exactly one year, but, you know, that's a that's a huge change in mortality that will that is changing the average lifespan of Americans, because it's not just older people getting this and dying. You know, they got vaccinated first. You look now in the hospital, and it's teenagers to it's everybody, every every uh, every generation is in the hospital right now, and some of them are very sick. Yeah, speaking of that, that spawns off a few different paths we could go down as far as uh, as far as unpacking some of that. But going to the folks that are not 
vaccinated or that will not get vaccinated, how or what happens with that group when there's a group of people that are vaccinated? Yeah, it's a it's a it's a couple things uh, you mentioned. First of all, because of the effect, even after one dose of the vaccine, that lowers the total numbers quite a bit. You have the fully vaccinated, which is now almost 50%. That's going to lower it even more. However, you have the variants come in, which makes it actually more contagious. That's why the UK is having a little uptick right now, because they have this uh, Delta variant in there. So what's going to happen is you're going to have everybody out there, the ball games, you know, the department stores, restaurants and everything, and the vaccinated people are not going to get sick. And the unvaccinated people, they're going to have this epidemic in the middle of the epidemic. They're going to have they're, ha- they're going to continue with their own epidemic. Ninety eight percent will survive, uh, but two percent are not going to survive. Approximately two percent, and so that's going to go forever. And then you have the global problem. The whole thing is not going to go away until the entire world is vaccinated. It's just people travel so much that this thing, you know, unless you want to just shut down international travel, um, this thing isn't going away until everybody is vaccinated. Or there's going to be very heavy restrictions of movement. Um, Have you ever seen one of those yellow uh, vaccination cards? Uh, I haven't seen a yellow one, no. Okay. They've been around for 50 years. Okay. It's for getting vaccinated for yellow fever. It's a yellow card. Uh, I, since I travel in Africa quite a bit, I'm, I always carry my card. When I forget it, I have to bribe the immigration <laughs> and the customs guy for $100 usually. Anyway, that's another story. But anyway, <laughs> you always carry that card. I'm vaccinated. I have the digital thing, but, you know. But anyway, I've carried that card for years. And so, you know, in that way, we keep yellow fever, which a third of the people die if they get it. We keep that, you know, kind of controlled. Same thing is going to be with COVID. Um, The international travel is not going to open up until some kind of vaccine um, proof of vaccination or proof of immunity is, is out there. Um, domestically, we do whatever we want. You know, we'll just let this little epidemic go go around. You know, they're going to get every everybody in the United States who's not vaccinated is going to get COVID. Every single unvaccinated person is going to get COVID, or they're going to ultimately take the vaccine. This, this is like a given. Yeah. Now, for the international people, we're not. We're, we, the, most of the countries uh, are organizing now, thinking about opening up travel, and they're going to require proof of vaccination, and they're going to require a test before you get on. This is so France is actually doing this supposedly this week. So if you want to go to France, you have to have, show your vaccine card, and you have to have a nasal te- you know, a nasal swab test that shows that you're negative. You have to do both. And, you know, that's what's going to happen. So to travel anywhere in the future internationally, if you don't travel internationally, it doesn't make any difference. But if you're going to travel internationally, you are going to, they're going to, they're trying, they, they, that has to stop. Now, if there are borders where people cross without anybody looking or anything, and there's many of these borders around the world, you know, they'll keep spreading it and whatever. But, you know, that is one way to kind of keep the the pandemic, uh, keep a lid on it, uh, at least in terms of the international travel. So the people that refuse the vaccine who are not infected, um, they're going to have um, a, a big trouble traveling internationally if they care. And, you know, maybe they don't care. So how does that work, though, with... All right. Well, let's let's just assume we live in a world where 
or the United States, every adult gets vaccinated, but the children are not vaccinated. They're going to get vaccinated. <laughs> That's coming. <laughs> at, at what what age does it does it stop? Six like months. every? Oh, really? Six months? Oh yeah, yeah. The study's ongoing right now. So uh, Moderna actually yesterday filed um, EUA for EUA authorization uh, for uh, twelve to uh, I think twelve or eleven to 17, just like Pfizer has. Yeah. We'll have two for the teenagers. Um, and then under that, there are studies going with thousands of kids from six months to 11 years of age. Um, and soon, maybe in six months, uh, those studies will be completed because now we know really what the end point, we know what to measure to, to see if a vaccine is working and if it's safe. So you don't have to do 30,000 children like we did right. with the adults. You only have to do, you know, several thousand kids. Uh, and then you can see the immune response. You know what the dose is. They get smaller doses, you know. And, you know, let, let's face it, kids get vaccines all from birth. You know, so we, that's, kids are the ones that take most of the vaccines that are out there. So kids can handle uh, vaccines. Kids are very good at handling vaccines. So there's no difference uh, here. Does the lab, is there a way for the lab to measure consequences on some of this without it taking an infinite amount of time? Like, like I know a fear that some people have is what happens in five years from now or 10 years from now? And then there's a side effect we didn't know about. Is there, is that being done somehow in a lab yeah. and through technology? Yeah. First of all, it's being it, the FDA is mandating that everybody that was in these vaccine trials gets followed for at least two years, and they may they're most likely going to ex extend that. Those each one of those trials was between thirty and forty four thousand people, each company. All right. Yep. Those patients, the last person that was enrolled in that study, has to be followed for two years minimum. And. And, and so they're going to be tested, like, you know, for all sorts of stuff. Uh, and, you know, so that's part of the deal that they make when they get their approval. Pfizer has already applied for full FDA approval, not emergency use authorization, but full approval. Uh, because their last patient in the study is has gone six months. So as far as long-term effects of the vaccine... The mRNA vaccine, the actual, the secret sauce, you know, the juice, mm -hmm. it's like gone after like a day or two. It triggered the immune response and then it, it's it got, there's nothing in there. It doesn't really hang out or anything. It's, it's not DNA. It doesn't do anything to your DNA. It's just turn your cells on to make these proteins and then the immune system has responded to it. And the immune system is really good. I mean, we run into pathogens, viruses and bacteria, parasites every day. And you don't get sick. Your body just takes care of it. And it remembers. It has a great memory, immunologic memory. And that's what's happening. Now, you may need a booster shot, you know, in case the, that memory gets a little bit off. But, uh, you know, it, the, the immune system is, uh, is great. So the vaccine's gone. Vaccine's not going to do anything afterwards. So, so no GPS chip is implanted in you. No, I had, <laughs> to I you. I had a <laughs> surgery here. No, I mean, uh, no, there's no nothing. Like, there's nothing. <laughs> That's uh, like one of the the great. There are many great myths in this. Uh, yeah, piece. I, but you know, and I hate to say it because I've studied pandemics. These myths existed in every other pandemic that's been out there. There's just craziness right. everywhere. The the best uh, examples with the 1918 flu, which killed, you know, half a billion people in the world, you know. So, um, you know, there were crazy myths about that. There were fights about masks. There was, you know, it, it's all, it's just like reading history again. The president, Woodrow Wilson, never mentioned it. <laughs> he never mentioned there was a flu pandemic going on in the country that was killing young people. You know, it's like, okay, let's just not talk about that. He also gutted. Wow. He was very sick. 
uh, you know, nothing, nothing. No one in 1920, in 1920, okay, the pandemic is over. It's not even mentioned in the uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, you know, any of the encyclopedias that came out. No one, it didn't even talk about it. Um, I'm going to ask you a trivia question. When do you think the first book was written about the 1918 flu pandemic? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, I would say World War II, 1942. 1976, I think. Oh, yeah, off by a few decades. Yeah, my Alfred Crosby. It's either 76 or 73. I'm getting a little daft here, but I mean, it, it took until the 1970s for somebody to put. There was plenty of information out there. It was in the newspapers yeah. and people writing about it scientifically and stuff, but nobody actually ever put the whole picture together, and they were so busy. Everybody was so busy fighting World War One. Uh, and they didn't want to detract from a world war, which was a, obviously a giant catastrophe. Um, and so they just didn't talk about it. Yeah, I figured in the 1920s they, they wouldn't. We also had the Roaring Twenties then. Well, People uh, celebrated the fact that they were getting out of it. The war was over and the yep. pandemic, after the third big wave, it just disappeared. That's incredible how history re repeats itself. Yeah. Um, this is, uh, so that was, and they did the same thing with the masks and they had winter kids in New York City having school outside in January. <laughs> I mean, there was all sorts of crazy stuff, but I mean, they got in the, you know, fresh air and masks work. So what about the masks now for this? It's, I mean, some of it seems real and some of it seems silly like if you're going into a restaurant for example and no one has to wear a mask except the walking 10 feet from mm -hmm. the host stand to the restaurant booth does that make sense to you no it makes no sense and i'm glad you said it not me <laughs> silly <laughs> <laughs> it's completely silly and what's what's happening is is the people who are vaccinated are wearing the masks now Right. And the, and the unvaccinated people who don't believe in COVID or getting vaccinated are not. <laughs> so the people that need the masks are not wearing it. And the people that don't need them are wearing it. And it's just it shows you a little bit about human nature. Just any kind of change is just, you know, there's just so much inertia, so much fear of change. First, we none of us wanted to wear a mask. I actually gave a talk on Chinese television in February telling them that they didn't have to wear masks. I hate to admit this because the science, what I thought was, the, the, the virus is about a third the size of the pore in the, in the tightest mask, the N95 mask. And so what good is a mask going to do? This stuff is going to get in there anyway. Well, unfortunately... <laughs> I was wrong in the fact, yes, the virus is very little, but it's in a globule of mucus or, you know, in stuff. And that gets hung up. Uh, and it actually, the masks actually work quite well. Um, fortunately, no one listened to me back then. <laughs> they continued to use their masks. Uh, but the Chinese who wear masks anyway, half the time in China, mostly because of pollution, um, you know, they were like, what? This guy's crazy, um, which I was wrong. Um, not crazy, but I was definitely wrong. So we learned, we've learned. we learned a lot about masks. They work. Double masks. Two, two masks work better than one. Uh, staying. The, one, the other thing that uh, is a, is, was wrong was the whole six feet thing. Actually, the data are con controversial. Uh, it, the benefit starts at three feet. Uh, and that's where it begins. And the, the benefit from three feet to six feet is not nearly as big and the data are not as strong as from zero to three feet. And then it all depends also what kind of room you're in. Right. Airflow in the room. Yo, you know, it went from it's in the air. No, it's not in the air. It's just person to person droplet transmission. Uh, and then now we've come back to 
yes, it is in the air. And it does flow around. If you're downstream, air conditioned, blowing on you in a restaurant, somebody three tables up can, you know, can give it to you. So, you know, it's we've we've learned quite a bit, uh, and I think hopefully uh, we've learned our lesson. And the next time this comes up, we'll do it the right way, right off the bat. And I, I hope that 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 will happen because, you know, coronavirus. There's lots of coronaviruses. This is just one of many. SARS was a coronavirus, if, but it didn't spread as easily as this one. But SARS killed 10% of everybody in Right, it was more deadly. And MERS is another one, Mideast Respiratory, Syndrome, Respiratory Syndrome Virus. That kills 30% of people that are infected. But that's limited really just to the Mideast um, and people who've traveled there. So if another coronavirus comes around, who's to say it doesn't kill 50% or 10% or 5%? Where is the um, kind of, uh, where are we going to get the right leadership with the right mitigations in place quick enough um, based on the mortality rate? This virus was very sneaky. It, It only killed one to two percent of the people that were infected. So, you know, a lot of people got sick and they got over it. You know, they say, oh, yeah, I did fine. You know, it's like, (laughs) but look at the hospitals. I mean, the hospital system in New York City in their their first wave, I mean, the hospital system imploded. I mean, it was very close to collapsing. I don't know if you remember back then. Oh, yeah. Just a disaster. Here in Chicago, we learn from the New York experience. And, you know, the governor, you know, nobody was going to the convention center anyway. (laughs) The governor opened up a 3,500, I think it was 3,500 bed emergency hospital that the Corps of Engineers came in and helped them and everybody, it was incredible. And then, uh, you know, (laughs) they had like 35 patients. Right. (laughs) They closed it down. They didn't need it, but they were, you know, they learned. We learn from our mistakes. And like, those are the kind of mistakes. Okay, they're mistakes. But that's a good mistake to have, to be prepared. You know, next time we'll have it. The other thing is that we missed, we've missed out on two things. One is the um, um, uh, monoclonal antibodies uh, were developed pretty quickly by Regeneron Company and uh, Eli Lilly. And they were underutilized they could really have been helpful, more helpful than they were. Now, Regeneron just came out with a subcutaneous, I think uh, either, I think it's a subcutaneous injection. But anyway, uh, it, it doesn't have to be given as an intravenous infusion anymore. So it can be a shot. I'm not sure if it's sub-Q or IM. I, I don't know. I haven't used it yet. But, the, um, but that will really help a little bit. And then several other companies are making oral tablets that should work quite well. This is a virus that we know everything about this virus now. I mean, all the the structure of it, you know, and there are definite drug targets that some of the medicines out there can work on. And so uh, Pfizer um, has a, they've been touting that they have a drug and they're starting the development. Uh, Merck has a drug fairly long uh, ahead in uh, development. Actually, I think they're in phase two, three right now. And a, a company in Boston called Atea, they're, they've got another one of these drugs too. So, you know, these at least three companies are making these drugs. Uh, and, uh, you know, if so, if you get diagnosed with COVID, you know, it would be like, if you've ever heard of Tamiflu? Oh, yeah. It's the drug yeah. for the flu. Well, it works if you take it like right away. So, but the other good thing that the government has done is they've they poured pumped billions of dollars into testing. So remember at the beginning, you know, even if you were dragging yourself to the hospital right. and while you had COVID, you know, looks like you're going to live. We don't have to test you. You know, now you can go to the pharmacy and you can buy the a kit and test yourself. You know. And that actually may be one of the reasons why the number of positive cases is down because people are testing themselves and then they don't report it. Um, so we, we, there may be more out there. But anyhow, we, our testing capacity has just astronomically skyrocketed 
the capacity has increased so much. And that is also because of um, uh, Operation Warp Speed. Uh, that's the vaccine uh, program. Yep. And this, uh, what they call RADx, Rapid Acceleration of Diagnostics. So BARDA, Warp Speed, RADx, it's, um, that's really what pushes this uh, thing along. I was going to ask you about the, the timing of testing. So I, I had three tests personally, never tested positive. And then uh, a week later, I had symptoms that I, I just couldn't smell anything. Like I, I literally couldn't smell anything and what kind of couldn't taste did, anything. What kind of test did you have? The, the, I, I believe it's the PCR it test. How fast did it take you to get the results? It was like uh, a day, 24, okay. 48 hours. It, it, yeah. Test. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't rapid. The thing is they could have missed it. I mean, the, the virus comes up a couple days after exposure increases a lot and then goes down. And by day 10, it's pretty much gone. So you might've been a little bit too early. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, if you lost your sense of smell, you had it. Have you had the <laughs> antibody? Oh, you had the vaccine though, right? Yeah, I've, I've had the vaccine. Okay. So you can get an antibody test to figure out if you had it. Um, you have to get the one with the uh, nucleocapsid antibody because the vaccine doesn't cause that antibody to that. So, um, that you can you can get one of those antibody tests to figure out if you actually had COVID. Yeah, it was strange. I didn't have any other symptom, and there's so few other things that <laughs> you, you I know. had it. I bet you had. I know. It. I know. I think so as well. Have you had uh, folks that have had the vaccination end up getting COVID? Yeah. Somehow. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. It's and then, very. We're, we did a study here at Northwestern. And we were studying um, people who were exposed to somebody who had documented COVID. And then many of the, so uh, the people that that person had exposed, um, many of them had had the vaccine. So, you know, most of them were negative, but there were a, a large handful, not a lot, but I mean, not just one, I don't know, you know, five or six people who tested positive. And they had, I think only one person had clinical disease. And even that was mild, you know, so they had these little mild infections, which probably gave them even more immunity. So what will happen naturally is, you know, you're vaccinated, you'll still get infected, but that will, you won't get sick and you'll develop even more immunity to corona. Kind of, yeah, kind of like the flu. Yes, right. right. Exactly. Yeah, it works the same you know, way. So this is going to keep rolling uh, like that, um, just like the flu. It's a good, very good example. So I know we got to wrap up in a few minutes, but I'm dying to pick your brain on what you predict the next 12 to 24 months is going to be like here in the, in the United States and then the world. Yeah. Well, I've been wrong on almost all my math. <laughs> I'm going to continue my streak. <laughs> so I no, I've I've good odds now. You're going to be right. <laughs> this is going to be great. Well, I mean, I believe in the technology, so I think the vaccines may have to be modified, and you're most likely going to need a booster. But I don't know when. But that could be within a year of your first vaccine, or two or three years. We don't know. But you you'll need a booster. So what? Um, you will. The diagnostics is like great now. You can get, get a test anytime, anywhere, drugstore, anywhere. There's just tons of places to get tested now. All that's good. We are now getting serious about setting up surveillance systems and doing the genomic analysis uh, of the viruses. I think we're, we're the, our public health people uh, are moving in the right direction. And I think this is a global thing as well. Uh, and so I think it'll take, though, unfortunately, probably three to five years to vaccinate everybody in the world. I mean, you're talking about seven billion people. Yeah. Um, and so once everybody in the world. So what will happen is regionally you're you're going to have some successes. Uh, and I think the United States is heading into a controlled situation 
similar to Australia, but only because of the immunity we've created. Now, the Australians will catch up with us because they ultimately will vaccinate everybody there. I mean, it's it's like twice the size of Illinois, you know, right, right. Uh, population wise. So, uh, you know, they'll ultimately get their immunity up. Uh, and and so you're going to have regions of the world where it's it's pretty well controlled. But the 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 real um, uh, problem will be the internet, the global component. Um, and that is going to take years and it's going to take a lot of money, uh, to vaccinate everybody in the world. Cause many of the countries that need to get vaccinated really have limited resources that are not going to be able to do it without help, but we have to do it, uh, unless we just want to close all the borders, which I think is never going to happen. So does a medication like Tamiflu, does that prevent folks that are anti-vaccination from getting the vaccination? Because they know that there's, that yeah. there's a way that they can be cured or I mean, relieved. Let's say, let's say the COVID Tamiflu gets approved in the next year, which is actually very likely, uh, and the monoclonal antibodies get to be just a shot. Uh, and that you can get a diagnostic test like anywhere. So these unvaccinated people, um, if they've been exposed to somebody, they can go take one of those drugs to prevent it from happening. Or if they get it, they can take one of those treatments so they don't get sick. And then they'll develop immunity from, from the infection. They're going to have to develop immunity at some point. Um, and they're going to most likely get infected because I think it's going to be very difficult to really strategize getting the preventive therapy after an exposure because a lot of times you don't know the person that's infectious. You know, oftentimes they don't have any symptoms. So right. I'm unvaccinated. I don't have any antibodies. I come in contact with somebody. That person gets sick two days later and exposed me, but I don't know that person got sick. So the, the unvaccinated crowd is, they're going to, they will ultimately get inf infected. Got it. But it may not be as bad. They won't have the one to 2% mortality because the treatments will be better. But it's much better for those folks to get vaccinated today. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, if you believe the, the last study that came out of that insurance group in California, um, very large analysis 14% of people um, who, and I'm not talking about the people that only had mild or moderate infection, had long-term side effects. Yeah. This is not good. So who, this is a very strange virus. You know, like with influenza, you know, you get really sick, but then you get over it. You recover and you get over it if you survive, and most people survive. But you don't, the long-term consequences after influenza is pretty rare. COVID is a different animal. And there's too much of this long haul stuff. Is there anything that you would recommend aside from the CDC's website, any sort of um, publications that you rely on? Aside from, obviously, you said, you said the news media today gets the information just as fast as anywhere else. Yeah. Is there is there yeah, something one of the you'd problems recommend? is that there's so much information, right? And you don't know which ones to trust. So the CDC is a, is a good one. The NIH is a good one, but it's kind of wonky. <laughs> University of Washington, um, the uh, Hopkins website gives you tons of data. Um, WHO, we have our own website. Many universities uh, and academic centers have their own. We have one called Covaxin. C-O-V-A-X-C-E-N. It's part of our Global Health Institute, and we have articles for the lay, lay press and scientific white papers and stuff. It's a group of people. It's a scientist like myself and working with communication experts. It's a joint venture between the medical school and the school communications to sort of get the word out. So there's that. I'm plugging that. I mean, it doesn't cost anything. You can but, you know, there are legitimate places to go, but you've got to really be careful because there's a lot of craziness out there. 
Well, stick with the academic, stick with the academics, and stick with the known uh, entities that uh, will give you a fair shake. You know. Yeah, that's that's great advice. And Dr. Murphy, I can't thank you enough for your your time today and your your service and being on the front lines and and having dealt with this your whole career um, and kind of seeing this whole thing play out and being courageous for us all. And, you know, thank you very much. We usually don't get, you know, epidemiologists and virologists don't usually get much attention. You know, it's like thrust into the spotlight, you know, we're, we're not really prepared for that. So we don't, we don't necessarily communicate that well. We're, uh, but uh, it's, uh, thank you for inviting me on for letting me uh, chat with you this long. I I do appreciate it because the, the questions are so important. And like I said, you guys have way more power over this health condition than anything else going on in healthcare. Because the data is coming through public channels like yourself. Uh, so you're way more important than I think you realize. Is, is there anything I didn't ask you having said that, that you would want to share? No, I think I think you asked really good questions, and I, I think they were pretty thorough. I think you covered really all the major points. We don't have to make it too complicated, right? You know, yeah, the yeah. vaccines were developed quickly because of the technology and the money. There was no shortcut. The vaccines work. You know, side effects happen, but COVID is even worse. You know, right? Keep it simple. Yeah. Well. Thanks again. Uh, it was great to spend this hour with you and good luck on, uh, on everything. Yeah, same to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Murphy, for being an awesome guest on today's show and breaking some of this stuff down. I know I had a lot of questions. Many of you out there who are listening or watching this may have similar questions. I'm sure you have additional ones as well, but I thought it was really important to take this time to bring on an expert and break some of this stuff down. I know for some of you, this can be a controversial subject regarding vaccinations and by no means is this podcast aiming to give any sort of medical advice, but I wanted to just bring on someone that understood the historical context of what's going on and that could break down some facts for us. Hopefully you got something out of it. If you did, please share it with a friend. Follow Not Almost There on any podcast platform. Wherever you're listening or watching this on, I'd greatly appreciate it. And stay tuned for another episode next week. Until then, remember me, you, we are not almost there.